the first part of this series, I started to tear down this vintage frequency counter from the 1970s. In part 2, I continued that teardown by disassembling this module. After that, I built a voltage multiplier cascade for an output voltage of up to 2.4 kV and delivered a thorough explanation of its working principle. In today's episode, I will again continue the teardown by taking apart this module. After taking a closer look on some of its parts, I will use the multiplier cascade to show you an experiment that I devised to demonstrate the effect of thermionic emission, which is the principle that vacuum tubes are based on. In order to improve the experimental setup, I will also show and explain how old magnet moving coil instruments, like the ones we found inside the frequency counter, can be repurposed, a skill that we will later need to build the vacuum tube testing environment. So let's start with today's teardown. What you see here is the biggest of the modules, which I took from inside the device. Other than the modules we have seen before, this one carries a range of rectangular aluminium boxes, the purpose of which is still to be uncovered. And again, a multitude of vacuum tubes can be seen, most of them protected by these black metal shields, which need to be unclipped to see the tubes themselves. Then, two Bosch brand metallized paper capacitors of the same type used for the multiplier cascade are mounted on top of the module as well. Here we can see two old-fashioned socketed crystal oscillators manufactured by QK. One rated for 7.25 MHz and the other one for an impressive 90 MHz. A large number of adjustable inductors is again present as well. On the right hand side we find a mysterious chrome plated cylinder, which we will examine in detail later in this video. After taking the first look on the module, I start removing all wires and cables that are still connected to it. These are high quality coaxial cables with silver plated connectors. With the likewise silver plated jacks present as well, these could be reused in a multitude of RF applications. With the module turned upside down, it is now possible to remove the covers from the unit. Two of the silver plated sheets are much shinier than the others because I rejuvenated their surfaces, as you can see in one of my videos from about a week ago. Inside, we find a similar picture to the one inside the other module, which I disassembled in part 2. Compartmentalized silver plated shields protecting discrete high frequency circuitry. A large portion of the inductors wound again from silver wire. With the tubes mounted outside the enclosure, all components that we see inside are passive components. Classic resistors, ceramic and foil capacitors and coils with adjustable ferrite cores. As far as I can tell all made in Germany. The overall state of the silver is in better shape than in the first module. My guess is that this is because of lower temperatures present inside this enclosure. Many parts are soldered together with silver wire as well. Before we can take a closer look on the as of yet unidentified components, I first have to clear out the enclosure as good as I can. I first remove the tube shields and tubes and the crystal oscillators. Then I proceed by cutting out the majority of the passive components from inside the enclosure. I have parts like these by the thousands and they will not be reused. With that being done, some interesting details are revealed. For example, we see a thin silver plated metal tube that connects two physically separated compartments of the device. A fine coaxial cable is running through it. Now I proceed by removing the adjustable inductors. They are of the same type as the ones we discovered in part 2, only that this time there are a lot more of them. A great score and I guess I will use all of these in future projects. Then the tube sockets are being unscrewed. After that I remove this large aluminium shield, revealing some wire looms hidden underneath. Then the unidentified aluminium boxes are unscrewed. With that being done the enclosure is almost stripped clean. These little metal cans, by the way, are capacitors, even though they might look like old-fashioned transistors. Now we can take a look inside the aluminium boxes. And ta-da! These are again shielded adjustable LC filter modules and, if I may say so, 
the most beautiful and well-made ones that I have ever seen. The coil inside is a combination of the two types of inductors that we have seen before. A compartmentalized plastic bobbin holding copper magnet wires and an adjustable ferrite core that is again attached to a low permeability brass screw with several centimeters of distance between the screw head and the ferrite. These components will also be reusable in all kinds of RF projects. The only portion of the circuitry that remains now is this one. The chrome plated cylinder is connected via various silver wires to an oddly shaped adjustable component that reaches several centimeters out of the enclosure, shielded by a silver plated tube. After taking out the cylinder, we can unscrew its cover and find out what's inside. What might look like an inductive component at first glance is what is called a crystal oven. And these copper windings are not there to generate a magnetic field, but to act as heater wires to bring the entire cylinder to a stable temperature. Upon opening the inner cylinder, we can pull out the heart of the entire frequency meter. No, it's not a nuclear warhead, it's a 1 MHz crystal oscillator that must have been the centerpiece of a highly accurate frequency standard that this meter needed to determine the frequency of an external signal. It again is branded QK. The other odd looking component, by the way, is an adjustable capacitor. I'm sure its purpose was to minutely adjust the oscillation frequency of the crystal oscillator inside the crystal oven. So, with a nearly empty enclosure, we can again get an overview over the salvaged components. An impressive number of German-made vacuum tubes, sockets and shields could be recovered. And they will be used in all consecutive parts of this video series. Furthermore, an assortment of rare inductive components could be recovered. The coax cables and of course the crystal oven are valuable components as well. With that being done, the salvage is complete, because I have decided not to disassemble the two remaining units. I will sell them instead. But we will of course still take a look inside in the next video. For now, it's time to come to the second part of this video though, where interesting experiments and builds are waiting for us. So let's dive right in. The experiment that is now going to follow is set up to deliver evidence for the existence of the effect of thermionic emission, also known as the Edison or Edison-Guthrie effect. And this is how it works. The variable isolation transformer delivers a supply voltage to the multiplier cascade. Connected to the output of the cascade are these two movable steel electrodes. The one attached to chassis ground is the cathode, that's the one with the brown wire. The other electrode with a blue wire is the anode, which is connected to the 2 kV output pin. In the current path of the anode, we have a magnetic moving coil instrument with a measuring range of 100 microamperes. The DMM on the right hand side displays the voltage across the voltage divider of the cascade. The electrodes are positioned so that they face each other. The distance is set to around 6 mm. That distance should be as small as possible but yet large enough to prevent the current from arcing over. And the experiment begins. The isolation transformer is switched on and adjusted so that 2 kV DC are present across the cascade and thus between anode and cathode. Upon taking a look on the left meter we can see no reading. The needle is not pointing exactly to zero because the instrument is not adjusted correctly. It shows the exact same reading as when no voltage is applied to the electrodes. By the way, don't be irritated by the labeling of the meter. The instrument was once used in an old R&S transmitter, which I disassembled a few weeks ago. In that application it was part of a circuit to measure a voltage. In this application, however, it measures a current. You have to divide the number it points to by 2 and multiply it with 1 microamps to get the actual value that is being measured here. Furthermore, you have to subtract 1 to 2 microamps because it is not pointing to zero when no current flows. Now I take this gas torch and I bring it into position to heat up the cathode as good as I can. Now
Now that the steel cathode has reached a red-hot temperature, let's have another look on the instrument. As you can see, a minute movement of the needle can be seen. Upon bringing the electrodes closer together, a stronger reading can be detected. But now watch what happens next. Did you hear that? That was the sound of a spark. The current arced over and it destroyed the instrument. After removing the instrument altogether, you can here see how an arc is created periodically. The arc is generated as soon as a certain threshold voltage is reached. The arc breaks down though as the cascade discharges. Then the cascade recharges again until a new arc is created and so on. This effect was actually used by early pioneers like Nikola Tesla to create oscillators before even vacuum tubes were invented. If I was a lazy person I would now stop and say that my experiment showed a needle movement and that that proves that an electric current was flowing even when no arc was created. That would mean that electrons were emitted by the glowing cathode, an effect called thermionic emission. But since I'm not lazy, I will now improve the experimental setup and deliver a more convincing result. It would also be great if this time no precious instrument would have to die for it. But for that, a measuring amplifier circuit must be specifically designed and built. And I take that as an opportunity to explain to you how you can use old instruments or meters to measure anything you want. Here you have an assortment of instruments which I have salvaged from all kinds of devices over the years. Some were used to measure volts, some amperes, some decibels and so on in very specific applications. But how can you reuse them for a new totally different purpose? Let me explain. Virtually all old instruments can be repurposed. This can easily be done with a voltage divider if the new measuring range is bigger than the rated measuring range of the instrument. For that you have to follow three simple steps. First, you have to measure the internal resistance of the meter. You can simply do that by connecting it to a multimeter. Second, read off the maximum current that the meter was rated for. With professional instruments a current rating can be found on the back side. If no rating is printed on the enclosure, you have to approximate the value. The lowest typical value is 10 microamperes. So if you don't know it better, you should treat the instrument as if it was made for that low value and then work your way up experimentally until you know the true value. Third, calculate the value for a divider resistor that has to be connected in series in order to set the measuring range and prevent the instrument from being destroyed. You can do that by simply using Ohm's law and transposing for the divider resistor. The size of the resistor required is the maximum value of the voltage measuring range divided by the maximum current minus the internal resistance of the instrument. Ok, so to put this theory to the test, let me apply it to a simple example. This is the larger one of the two instruments which I salvaged from the front panel of the frequency meter in part 1. The upper one of its two scales reaches from 0 to a value of 110. Since it can easily be realized and read off, I will now size a divider resistor in such a way that the meter's measuring range will be exactly 11 volts. So when 11 volts will be applied, the needle will indicate a 110. When 10 volts are applied, it will point to 100 and so on. In other words, we can use this old instrument to measure a DC voltage as it is used in many practical projects. The maximum rated current can be found on the back side and it is 1 mA. I now measured its internal resistance, which is 291.3 ohms. The rated current is, as I said before, 1 mA. Combined with a new measuring range of 11 volts, I have all I need to determine the size of the divider resistor. And it must have a resistance of roughly 10.71 kilo ohms. My solution to do that is to connect a 10 kilo ohm resistor and a 1 kilo ohm trimmer potentiometer in series. And as a man of action, I build up that circuit immediately. 
and I tweak the trim pot so that we reach the wanted overall resistance. Now I have set up the following experiment. A DC power supply is connected to the DMM on the left and our instrument plus resistors on the right. I switch the power supply on and I adjust the supply first to a value of let's say 6 volts. The needle is pointing to a 60, as expected. Now let's step up the voltage to 10 volts. And the needle points to 100. And finally let's try to adjust the voltage to 11 volts. It's quite hard because the potentiometer of the power supply is not sensitive enough. But as you can see, still pretty much bang on. So. As long as the measured voltages or currents are bigger than the rated value of the instrument, you can use a simple resistor to repurpose a beautiful old meter like this. If you want, you can even print a new scale on a sticker, open the meter's enclosure and glue a new scale on it. I guess this is a simple old school skill that you guys out there should try for yourself. This way you can easily add nice vintage touch to your projects. But what can you do if the voltages or currents that you want to measure are too small to be displayed by a given instrument? Well, that's a large field and I can't give you all the basics in this video. But what I can do is to lead you through this project in which I want to measure a current of around 1 microamperes. As you have seen earlier in the video, an instrument with a measuring range of 100 microamperes was barely able to pick up that minute current. That instrument is now destroyed. And what I'm left with is a meter that is 10 times less sensitive. At the same time, I have the problem that if an arc occurs, all of a sudden a very large current will flow that could destroy the second instrument as well. Well, let me just show you how I tackled this problem. A measuring amplifier has to be built. I will supply it from plus and minus 10 volts to make the calculations easier. I then write down the properties of the instrument. With these data I can calculate that I need a protection resistor of 9.71 kilo ohms in series with the meter. I do that because in case of an arc the amplifier would be totally overdriven, putting its output voltage as close to the rail as it can. In a worst case scenario 10 volts could therefore be present at the pins of the instrument. That's why I need a series resistor. There is also a good chance that an arc could destroy the amplifier which could lead to the meter being pulled to the rail permanently. This also means that the needle will point to 110 when the maximum output voltage of the amp is reached. I will use a 10k ohm resistor with a 2k ohm trim pot in series though because I plan to use this circuit with a more common plus minus 12 volt supply in the future. To measure the current flowing through the electrodes a shunt resistor is needed. Its value must be as low as possible to keep its interaction with the experiment minimal. Still, it must be big enough to deliver a voltage drop that is above the background noise. I chose 10 ohms comprised of 10 1 ohm resistors. Based on our earlier observation, I expect a current of 1 to 2 microamps, which would result in a maximum voltage drop of 20 microvolts over the shunt resistor. To set the instrument's measuring range to 20 millivolts would make a gigantic gain of 5 times 10 to the power of 5 necessary. Because that value is so large, I will cascade two inverting amplifiers with a combined gain of 500,000. The first stage is designed to have a gain of minus 1000 and the second one is designed for minus 500. And this is the actual circuit I came up with. In the cathode's current path our 10 shunt resistors are inserted. On the other end our instrument and its protection resistors are positioned. Then two inverting amplifiers connect the input and the output. The gain of the amplifiers can be adjusted by two trim pots which will be necessary to set the exact measuring range. Two more trim pots are added which are needed to delete the DC offset of the amplifiers. I use two LF351s because that's what I happen to have. In addition a group of varistors is added in parallel to the shunt resistor to protect the circuit in case of an arc. 
It is however questionable if this will work. By the way, the resistance of the spark gap is so large that we can basically neglect its existence to calculate the gain of the first amp. We can act as if the shunt themselves were a voltage source and use the standard equation for the inverting amplifier. While calculating the gain of the second stage, I set the output resistance of the first stage to zero, which is also unrealistic. But we have some pots that we can tweak, and I guess it's going to work just fine. And in general, no, the circuit is not designed to give any precision measurements. Its sole purpose is to give an indication of a current flowing. So, I place the required parts on a piece of Vero board and solder them together. The circuit also needs to be tweaked before it can go into action. Now I already have everything connected together and the experiment is going to be repeated. As you can see, a heating up of the cathode shows a clear increase in the current flowing through the circuit. A second and a likewise profound observation is that the current is much lower when I swap the electrodes and heat up the anode rather than the cathode. But what that has to mean, why it is so profound and how it led to the invention of the vacuum tube is the topic of the next episode in this series. We will then also consecutively develop the idea behind the different types of tubes from the observations that we have made today. But I also have a little announcement to make. There are two things. First, since the teardown of the frequency meter is almost completed, I'm thinking about disassembling some other vacuum tube based devices in the coming videos. In that way we could have a teardown in each consecutive part even though the frequency meter is already gone. And second, making videos for this series was actually intended as a minor side project. But as always it has already blown out of proportion. Making this video took me roughly 40 hours. It's not just what you see on screen. There is a lot of drawing, thinking, editing and stuff like that in the background. To be honest, I would like to continue this, but I don't know if I can afford it. But if you want to help me to keep this going, you can donate a few bucks. For that I have set up a PayPal donation link to be found in the About section of my channel. And there is also something in for you. Everyone who kicks in a few bucks can make a vote on what I should tear down next. There are these two candidates. This is a completely vacuum tube based oscilloscope built in the 1970s in what was back then the communist eastern part of Germany. What you can expect is some high voltage fun. Candidate number two is this Grundig tape recorder. It's a West German mid 70s build and it's still non-transistorized. What you can expect is some crazy mechanical engineering and a lot of vintage charm. So think about it and no matter what I hope to see you next time as well.